Very honored to be here this morning. Partly because it's something I deal with with my students all the time. We have big classes, so don't get too concerned, but there's always two or three in the U.S. survey and or the Texas history class who've never heard that Texas was part of the Confederacy. And they know for a fact, because their granddaddy and their daddy told them that we didn't have slaves and there weren't any Confederate soldiers from Texas. We're all about cowboys and oil wells and natural gas and good stories about winners. Well, thank you very much for the Texas Centennial Commission and forward we've actually managed to remodel ourselves. But back in 1860, we were definitely a southern state and we will play a vital role, a very large role, in all theaters of combat for the Confederacy, including right here at home. There we go, we start with this picture. This is a great shot or an artist's conception of what our ancestors, those of us who had ancestors in the Confederate Army, look like. They do look like they're going to conquer the world, don't they? <laughs> they look rough and scruffy, but this is what the world thought of us in 1861. <laughs> Harper's Weekly announcing that the Texas Confederates were coming, and my God, I'm sure the men looked even worse. <laughs> my students like that line, too. Texas, as I tell my students, is very much part of the Gulf South, the Cotton Belt South, the Black Belt South, and it'll become one of the first of the seven Confederate states to secede. Last among the seven, but that puts it in the first group. We left the Union even before they fired on Fort Sumter. So that puts us among the dedicated few in the Confederacy and one of the first stars on that seven-star flag. Texas, of course, was one-third slaves. We had an overwhelming majority in favor of secession, and most Texans of military age will actually serve in the Confederate armies or state troops defending the frontier or the coast. The secession ordinance itself made it clear why we were leaving, then they of course issued that explanation of causes. It was all about slavery. There is a clause seven where it talks about how the federal government had failed to defend our frontiers properly. Always a hot political issue in 1850s Texas. Um, but if you read that clause closely, they have an explanation as to why the federal government did not defend our borders properly. It was because we were a slave state and back around we go. So this is Orrin Milo Roberts at the time. He was president of the Secession Convention. He'll go on to be a Confederate officer and fight in the Trans-Mississippi. But in 1861, he has more immediate concerns, and that is the frontier of Texas and what we're going to do to defend Texas in this coming war as the federal troops load up and leave Texas under the various agreements and arrangements that they had made. So one of the first things that we'll have to do, even as we're passing a secession ordinance, is form two regiments, send one out to the western and northern frontier under Henry McCulloch, we'll send another to the southern frontier under Rip Ford to secure the forts, staff them, and begin the process of getting Texas through this new revolution, as many of them called it. As I said before, the news spread quickly that not only were Texans going to defend their state, but we were going to be part of the Confederacy and we would be sending troops rapidly to all theaters of the war. And this is the response of the Harper's Weekly. This is apparently what we were going to look like. A uh, lovely creature, isn't he? Got a rifle, several pistols in case that doesn't work. And I guess he would just club you to death or hack you with a machete if it came down to it. Um, I'm sure we had some fellows like this. Most of them look just like you and I, though. The first concern, securing the borders, will lead the 11th Texas Cavalry, so constituted in early eight, April and May 1861, to conduct the Texans' first outside the borders operation, which is the move into the Indian Territory. Forts Arbuckle, Cobb, Washita, all of those have been staffed by federal troops who are now departing as quickly as they can, northward to Kansas, most of them. Um, their commander having decided discretion was a better part of valor. So Colonel William C. Young, who had previously organized a regiment for the Mexican-American War, will lead a regiment called the 11th Texas Cavalry and other assorted units into the Indian Territory and secure the southern border. They'll continue north all the way up to Chestanala, which is kind of the high water mark early in the war for the Confederacy and the Texans, because they'll go all the way to the north, northeast corner of Oklahoma where 
that'll be pretty much as far as they get because things won't go very well from then on. The Indian Territory then will bitterly divide, become a split battleground, but Texans will always be watching their frontier. What's going to happen to William C. Young? Well, some of you know very well. He'll take the 11th Texas Cavalry east under orders from Confederate government. A lot of the Texans won't like that. They'll leave the ranks of the 11th Texas Cavalry and come home and go back to working on the border and defending their border and their homes from potential Indian invasions, raiders, bandits, and even Union Army troops. Uh, Young himself will be assassinated in the middle of the great hanging Gainesville, Texas. But his, what's left of his unit east of the river will serve on the books, and as many as 40 to 150 of them will serve in the ranks all the way through the end of the war in what we call the Western Theater. Of course, we have a Western border, too, and we have great ambitions. Um, I'm not going to go too deeply into this because the guy who wrote the best book on it is sitting over here and will be joining us later. But the Texans joined in that dream of securing not only southern New Mexico and Arizona, but maybe making it all the way to San Diego, California, and opening trade with Asia. Nobody ever said Texans and Confederates that didn't dream big. So, early in the war under John R. Baylor, John R. Baylor will organize what he called in the newspapers euphemistically a buffalo hunt. Troops will head west with the idea that they will take charge of all those federal posts in New Mexico and push as far west as they can. Baylor will actually secure a good chunk of southern New Mexico. He will cede command then to a general, Henry Hopkins Sibley, who will go all the way to the northern battles here at Glorietta Pass, which actually the Confederates did fairly well in, except they overlooked one small detail. They got their wagon train taken. So with lack of supplies, far from home, they will be forced to withdraw. But I'm always tickled when I used to go do some work for the National Park Service in New Mexico and Arizona, that there's actually a Civil War battlefield marked outside of Phoenix, Arizona, Battle of Picacho Peak. I think it was immortalized in a great Clint Eastwood movie called Good, Bad, and the Ugly, right? It was a little exaggerated there. I, didn't, I don't think these 50 Confederates who made it to Picacho Peak were dragging any artillery. But they made it, Sherrod Hunter and his detachment. So Baylor briefly will enjoy the title of governor of the Confederate Territory of Arizona. They'll actually be an Arizona Territory delegate in the Confederate Congress for the duration of the war. But in fact, by middle summer 1862, the Confederate and Texan dreams of taking over New Mexico, which as some of you know, date all the way back to the Santa Fe Expedition of 1841, has collapsed again, and we're actually defending the western environs of San Antonio. So Texans, early in the war, this is all, we're talking about prior to Bull Run, we're not talking about all quiet on the Potomac period, we're not talking about seven days battles. Before that, Texans are invading the Indian Territory, marching into New Mexico, and making themselves a voice to be heard in the Civil War conflict. Again, I'm always puzzled why students say, well, I don't think we were ever Confederates. You might want to ask New Mexico and the, Indian, and the Oklahoma residents about that. What about far to the east in places like Bull Run and Seven Days Battles? Well, the Texas cause was represented in the Army of Northern Virginia, which was organized actually in 62 under Robert E. Lee, by Hood's Texas Brigade. Some of you very well know that. John Bell Hood was not a native Texan, but he served here with the 2nd U.S. Cavalry, and he was a natural choice to succeed to the command of this brigade when it was officially organized. Originally, their commander was a guy named Louis Wigfall, a South Carolinian, who managed to get himself elected to the Confederate <coughs> Congress, and there he would bedevil Jeff Davis for the duration of the war. That opened the grounds then, or the pathway, for a real-life soldier to command the Texas Brigade, and that was Hood. He had fought Comanches, and so the Hood Texans were brigaded. There would be three regiments, 1st Texas Infantry, 4th Texas Infantry, 5th Texas Infantry, and then a variety of honorary Texans for the duration of the war. There was 18th Georgia, and there was the 3rd Arkansas, and they will be politely invited to the reunions after the war. After all, they might not be Texans, but they did try hard. <laughs> These are all the original battle flags of the original 4th Texas, excuse me, of Hood's Texas Brigade. 
And this, I think, is where they actually introduce themselves on the world stage. This is a wonderful painting, Dan Nance, Texas Fury. What it shows is that Hood, when he stepped up to become brigade commander, he had to relinquish command of the 4th Texas Infantry, which was his original charge. He told them when he stepped up to be their brigade commander that when they first went into combat, he would come back and lead them. So in June of 1862, as Hood brought his brigade onto the field at Gaines Mill, and his division commander, under orders from Lee, asked him if he thought he knew anybody who might be willing to take those Union positions. Hood said he wasn't sure, but he thought he knew some men who would try. And what had happened is that all the way through that day until late afternoon, the Confederates had tried to break the Union position at Gaines Mill across Boson's Creek and had repeatedly failed for various reasons. What Hood is facing with his brigade is three lines of entrenchments and behind it a hill that rises up and crowning the top of that hill, 18 Union guns. Hood took his men out on the field, lined them up as properly, as the, that's the way they fought, and Hood told them, let's go. And at that point, he dismounted and walked in front of his 4th Texas. And they cheered because he had kept his promise. He was going with them. As you can see in this painting, he is absolutely with them. Now, it came a moment when they probably wished he was not with them because he took them out across the open ground and then paused about 50 yards out from the Union positions. Now, picture that, folks. They're shooting at you. They're trying their best to kill you. And this man wants you to stop still. You haven't been allowed to fire your weapon yet. And get your lines straight. <laughs> now, there's a perfectly good reason for this. It's called command and control, right? Well, but if you're a 19-year-old Texas farm boy, you don't care about that part. But as one of them recalled, he said he looked over. Hood was leaning up against a tree eating an apple. While 50 yards away, people are shooting at him, trying to kill him. And he decided, well, if he can stand it, I can. And they got in their lines. They went all the way through all the li three lines of trenches to the top of that hill and took 14 out of the 18 guns and repulsed the Union cavalry charge by Hood's old regiment. Talk about irony. That next morning, Stonewall Jackson himself walked the field and said, looking at the dead and the positions that they had died taking, these were soldiers indeed. The 4th Texas wins its glory then at Gaines Mill. The 5th Texas will win its glory by slaughtering the 5th New York Zouaves at 2nd Manassas, or 2nd Bull Run. And, of course, the 1st Texas will lose almost a dozen color bearers in the cornfield and suffer perhaps 80% casualties in the fighting at Antietam. Hood will go on to be not only a division commander, but a corps commander and an army commander, but his brigade will always have his name in the Eastern Theater. So Hood's Texans with the Army of Northern Virginia. These are some of our Western soldiers. Love this picture. These are Terry's Texas Rangers. Now, I have a couple of prints or paintings in my office by a very famous Texas artist, Bruce Marshall. And I've always wondered about them because in the first picture they're shown charging, waving their sabers. Well, Terry's Texas Rangers didn't carry sabers. Go look at the statue on the front of the Capitol grounds, right? That guy's got quite a, a range of weaponry, but not, not sabers. No, Texas, Terry's Texas Rangers were known for their pistols and shotguns. And I have a later, uh, actually watercolor by Bruce Marshall, that shows them charging with their pistols drawn. I asked a friend one time, who may be here, I don't see him, um, what, what's the difference? He said, well, Bruce says he did more research for the second picture. <laughs> Got it. Uh, these guys will win their first fame, the first story where they really emerge on the theater on, as a force to be reckoned with, at a place called Shiloh. As the Confederate troops are retreating on the second day, Indiana infantry are pursuing the Confederate army closely. Um, Hood's Texas... Excuse me, Terry's Texas Rangers are told to slow them down, stop them. So they come out in a wild charge, a lot of them wearing some wedding gear that they had managed to pilfer, top hats, morning coats, striped pants. I'm sure they made a bizarre sight, and I'm sure they were quite amused at themselves. The Indiana troops instantly went into the usual defense mode that you had to defend against cavalry. Front rank drop on one knee, place butt on 
of rifle on ground with fixed bayonet, in other words, a wall of bayonets. Second and third ranks prepare to fire when the cavalry are close enough. This did not work well with Terry's Texas Rangers because all they did was rein in at about a range of maybe 20 to 30 feet and open fire with double barrel shotguns and revolvers. As one of the Terry's Texas Rangers later wrote, it was as much fun as shooting quail on the ground. And warfare had changed, hadn't it, thanks to Texans. No more brilliant, beautiful cavalry saber rattling charges. Now these people are carrying things like revolvers and shotguns. They're very lethal. Oh, by the way, in Terry's Texas Rangers will serve the duration of the war in the Western Theater and will make one of the last cavalry charges ever of the Confederate Army at a place called Bentonville. It was an entire Union Corps bearing down upon the Confederate left, threatening their withdrawal route across a bridge. A Union Corps, this would be about eight to 9,000 men. Terry's Texas Rangers, 50 strong, with some hospital convalescents made that last charge and stopped an entire Union Corps in their tracks and made them back up. Now, yes, there is a denouement to this story. The guy who commanded that Union Corps was later cashiered for being an idiot. But <laughs> Terry's Texas Rangers, 50 strong, made that last charge at Bentonville and then disbanded and headed home. In the Trans-Mississippi, we have John Walker's Texas Greyhounds. They kind of entered the party late. A lot of them were part of state units or local units. They're actually officially organized in 62. By that time, Hood's Texas Brigade is already enduring its first combat in the east. And of course, Terry's Texas Rangers have already lost their commander in Kentucky and have already made their stand at Shiloh and are entering into the myths and legends of Confederate history. Walker, though, inherits a very interesting group of guys who will become as noted as, say, even the Stonewall Jackson Brigade for their speed of movement, their ability to respond quickly to situations, hence Walker's Texas Greyhounds. Now, if you read Richard Lowe's wonderful book, and I surely highly recommend it, you'll also find that they were famous for other things as well, like keeping themselves well-fed and not really paying much attention to minor details like orders but they were effective combat soldiers. They will fight in the Overland Campaign, they will be involved in the Port Hudson Campaign, and then most famously they will defend the borders of Texas itself in the Red River Campaign of 1864, where they will take part in the Confederate overwhelming the Banks-led expedition in the battles of Mansfield and Pleasant Hill. Walker himself will then remain with this division on the borders of Texas, mostly in Louisiana operations, through the end of the war. But they will represent to me that vast majority of Texans who never went to the famous battles in Virginia. They never made it to Shiloh or Chickamauga or any of the big battles that people like to talk about. They just slogged their way through mucky swamps in South Louisiana, dusty roads in Arkansas, muddy campaigns all over central Louisiana. That's where most of the Confederates from Texas served, and probably most famously was Walker's Texas Division, commanded by this gentleman. By the way, there's a new edition of his memoirs coming out, Richard Lowe is going to publish soon. Yes, I always salt in the advertising part of my program. <laughs> what about home here in Texas? Now. There are those of you who know very well that the largest, bloodiest Civil War battle in Texas wasn't against Yankees, was it? Dove Creek is the one we always overlook. Kickapoos were moving from Indian Territory to Mexico, where they remain today. So that'll give you a hint as to who won the fight if they made it to Mexico and were there today. Um, but Texas state troops tried to intercept them in early 65 and basically got spanked. They under underestimated what the Kickapoo had with them or how many Kickapoo there were. But we really are focusing here on the Civil War. And when you talk about Civil War Texas, you have a pantheon or a triumvirate of three battles. You're going to get a lot more detail about each of these in turn. Uh, Sabine Pass and Galveston, I think, are on our program today. Suffice to say is that in 1862, Lincoln began to take seriously the idea 
that something needed to be done with this place called Texas. It might be out on the edge of the Confederacy. It might be out beyond anything that was of immediate concern to him, like defending Washington, D.C., but it was providing an immense amount of men, an immense amount of material. It was an open border with the Mexican trade line. Baghdad was booming at the mouth of the Rio Grande, therefore Matamoros and Brownsville were bringing in a lot of material. We probably will never know how much, but it made men like Richard King incredibly wealthy. It was a concern because the French were making their way to creating a new empire in Mexico, and that was a violation of the Monroe Doctrine and perhaps an imbalancing of the various balances of power that you might have in the Western Hemisphere and in the Western world. So worried about the French, worried about us, worried about the material they were bringing in, Lincoln begins to think seriously about Texas. And he has to leave it up to banks to figure out a way to get there. Now early in the war we had the blockaded Galveston, again no detail, but as by late 1862 Galveston is occupied by Union troops. We get a new boss in town John Bankhead Magruder, Prince John. He'd been a Lee officer in the seven days, perhaps had not done as well as Lee expected or as Lee wanted, so he's come west. And he will regain his reputation, at least among Texans, on the first day of January 1863 when he retakes Galveston. A young officer in that fight for Galveston was Dick Dowling. Dowling will be assigned to the coast at Sabine, Sabine Pass. Now, Sabine Pass had already been attacked once before and easily taken. Yellow fever had riddled its small garrison. So now the Union Army, having lost its toehold in Galveston, thought perhaps that Sabine Pass would be their entree to the Texas Railroad Network, such as it was, and a pathway to take Texas itself, at least the heartland the major areas that were producing so many men, so much material, and hauling so many goods up and out of Mexico. So Sabine Pass was it, except there's 42 Irishmen there, recruited at one of Dick Dowling's three bars in Houston. He was quite the, the businessman. You know, laugh, this guy owned half of Houston by the time he died in the late, in the 1860s. I'm kind of impressed with his business acumen. But he had recruited them, he had built a fort, and when the Union Navy, using a perfectly operational plan, if everything had just worked correctly, approaches that fort in September of 62, Dowling manages, by dint of hard work and rapid firing, to disable two of the Union gunboats, scare the others into running off, and of course wins immortality. Immortality so much that it became one of Jeff Davis's favorite things to insert in a speech as an anecdote after the Civil War. And there's even a wonderful letter in the archives at San Antonio where somebody is telling Davis that there's a new thing called a phonograph that you can record people's voices. And Davis is writing back to them saying, oh, we need to go record the veterans who fought in some of those incredible battles that people should always remember, such as... And he could have said Shiloh, he could have said Gettysburg, he could have said almost anything. He says Sabine Pass. Texans have the world's attention, don't they? So at home, we win at Galveston. We also have a victory at Sabine Pass. And then, of course, we all know, and if you don't, read my book and you'll find out, <laughs> who won the last battle of the Civil War? Rip Ford. Here's Rip with a nice Louis Plunk photograph taken. He's barely sitting up, malaria ridden. Still got that problem with that Comanche arrow that's stuck in his hand that keeps <coughs> erupting periodically. He thought it was a poison arrow. I think they just did him the disservice of rubbing it in buffalo dung before they shot it at him. But he's in the saddle. Late May, or excuse me, early May of 1865, the word comes that Union troops have come off Brazos Santiago Island and are moving up the, Brown, the Rio Grande River towards Brownsville. Now, we don't really know what was in the Union commander's head, but we do know a few simple facts. Number one, his boss was gone, gone to New Orleans on business. 
Second, this guy wanted to be a congressman someday, and third, he'd never been in a real battle, so he needed something on his resume. I think also he assumed the Confederates had abandoned Brownsville, but they had not. And so Ford races into his commander's office because he was not the district commander. Ford was simply the garrison commander at Brownsville at this time. And he tells his district boss, James Slaughter, that the Union troops are coming off that island, that that violated a truce he thought they understood everyone had. They were just going to wait for the end of the war. And Ford thought they ought to strike these people, drive them back. Slaughter, a West Point Virginian who thought all of Ford's men and most Texans were thugs anyway, I guess he's been reading that Harper's Weekly, hasn't he? Um, he didn't like Ford and Ford didn't like him. Slaughter says, no, I think we'll just back up and let him have Brownsville. That's when Ford said, I don't think so. You can go wherever you want to go. I'm going to go fight him. So Slaughter makes preparations to follow slowly while Ford races out and arranges whatever forces he can. Probably about 300 people, 300 riders, 300 members of the Rio Grande expedition as Ford had been told he was in command of the previous year. Um, cannons, they had a few. Trouble is, Texans don't want to be artillerymen, do they? And Ford had found that out. He could take his, their horses away from them. He could order them to go work in an artillery battery. And they'd just wait till night fell and sneak back home to wherever they came from and go back to working with their buddies. They did not want to be artillerymen. They wanted to be centaurs of the West, right? They wanted to be Terry's Texas Rangers on the, bo on the border. So Ford gathers what he can. He has a couple of sections of artillery, which are placed on this hand-drawn map. This map is actually drawn by a Union veteran of the fight and moves forward. I find it hysterically funny. As he moves forward, he's gathering all kinds of people with him. There are Tejanos in his ranks. And as he rides up to an artillery section, which is two guns, and shouts at them to fire, they just stare blankly at him. And he yells it again, fire. That's when George Giddings, I believe it was, rode up to him and explained, sir, they're French. <laughs> okay. Good for... So he yells, Alons, and they fire, and he's quite content, and they go on into the fight. There are French crossing the river. They're not bringing their artillery with them, but they're willing to take a shot at these Yankees who are flying a flag they hate, which is, of course, the U.S. flag. So Ford, with his polyglot conglomeration of Mexicans, Tejanos, Anglos, and a few stray French gunners, will drive the Union troops back to Brazos Santiago. Slaughter shows up about nightfall, fires his revolver in the direction of the enemy, and says, don't you ever come back. And that's why several <laughs> accounts will give the victory to Slaughter. But Slaughter himself issued a congratulatory order the next morning, congratulating Ford for his great victory. Gracious of him, wasn't it? Ford will soon, though, find out that Slaughter's been busy while he was absent. Slaughter has sold all ten of their artillery pieces to the French-Mexican forces in Matamoros for a large sum of money. Ford will have his men surround Slaughter's tent and inform him he's to surrender half that money to them since they haven't been paid, or he will never leave Texas alive. That's the Confederate mutiny on the border down there. Slaughter surrendered half the money and rode quietly off towards the direction of Laredo, and Ford paid his men. A lot of them then cross the river and go into Mexican service, including Ford. So when you tell the story of Texas defending Texas, it's really a fascinating tale of a stand by a very small group of men, Dick Dowling at Sabine Pass. It's the story of a wild fight on the water and on the docks at Galveston, which you will hear also at Galveston, and a polyglot force of men who probably should have been somewhere else fighting down at Palmito Ranch. The kicker I always tell people is Ford then becomes part of the Lost Cause mythology, just like Sabine Pass, just like Galveston. We talk about how the last battle of the Civil War was won by the Confederates in Texas. Small problem, Ford was not even a Confederate officer at this time. He's actually a Texas state officer, so we should embrace it as our victory, right? <laughs> not the Confederates. <laughs> Now, not all things in Texas are happy when you talk about the Civil War. You do have to 
acknowledge that some Texans did not vote for secession, some Texans did not want to support the Confederate cause, and for that some Texans paid with their lives. The Nueces River, we call it a massacre. There's a lot of debate over that, and I'm willing to engage in questions on that. But in um, summer of 62, 75 or thereabout Germans packed up their goods, headed for Mexico, were intercepted by troops, Confederate troops. There was a brief firefight. Uh, the point to me is, yes, prisoners were executed, and that's against the rules. That's not playing fair. Great hanging at Gainesville, of course, a few months later. Um, over 150, perhaps as many as 200 Texans were arrested under suspicion of being draft dodgers, which they were, refusing to pay their taxes, which they probably did, but also conspiring to help the Union Army invade Texas. That's the nebulous part of it. Did not matter. Over the next few weeks, in different stages, 40 men were hanged and two were shot by the civil, civilian vigilante court at Gainesville, Texas. There were those unionists who made it out. Alexander Hamilton of Texas will be appointed provisional governor. Most famously, though, is this gentleman sitting down here. Edmund J. Davis will become the colonel of the 1st Texas Cavalry, USA. And after the war, he'll become governor of Texas. A lot of Texans went into service, and I'm always working with this, with state troops. Somebody has to man those forts. Now, they're always under suspicion by conscript officers who are a little worried that maybe they're not interested in actually defending Texas from Indians, but in avoiding Confederate service. But they did yeoman's work, fighting not only the Kickapoo, but Comanche, Kiowa, Stray Leapon Apaches down in Atascosa County. Texas will remain a state under siege largely on its western frontier. And what happens is a lot of people will come to me and say, my great-great-granddaddy served in the Confederate Army, but I can't find any records of him. I always tell them, go look at the Texas State Troops list because you probably are going to find him there, and he probably served on the western frontier in several of those organizations. So what did we accomplish? Well, this is what we looked like according to the newspapers in the 1870s. Um, they've come to know us better. Notice how big the pistol is. Apparently our pistols are bigger than anybody else's in Texas. We're still not dressing very well. We still drink heavily. I love the Spurs. But they, in the 1870s, unlike perhaps a few of my students today, knew well that Texas had served in the Civil War and the Texans had forged yet another star in their firmament of reputation as warriors, as a military people willing to fight for their place, for their rights, for whatever it is they might define as an infringement upon those rights. But another part of the legacy is also this. This is a picture that I put in my, J my Polly book. This is Polly himself. He's missing his foot. He lost that at Darbyton Heights. His buddy next to him, from the second calf, that would be Ford's original organization, has lost his arm. The next fellow over, John McDaniel, served with Polly first in the 4th Infantry, came home after Antietam with an illness, joined back up with the 36th calf and lost his arm. And this fellow on the far right end is Polly's old lieutenant. He lost his left arm in the Battle of Antietam in the cornfield. This is the legacy also that Texas will have to wrestle with. If you ask these old guys if they had served or supported the Confederacy, they had a ready answer, didn't they? They didn't have any hesitation whatsoever. And they made darn sure, if you look at our landscape, as it's populated with their memorials and their monuments, that we never forgot that. The state might have started putting up monuments to the Alamo and other very worthy causes after the turn of the century, but these old gentlemen and their children and grandchildren made sure that their monuments were put up on courthouse lawns, state capitol grounds, etc. So if you look around and if you're paying attention, we have not forgotten our Confederate legacy here in Texas. As well, we shouldn't because it is an integral part of Texas's history, whether we care to remember that some days or not. I think we're supposed to go to Q&A now. You going to moderate this? Uh, you got to stay up here. Huh? Uh, yes, oh, okay. we, are going to Q &A. we are going to Q&A. Uh, we, uh, we are recording, so we'd like to catch your 
your voice, your audio, and so we have microphones here for people with questions. Please wait for a microphone before you ask your question and hands So you will be back in here so we get it on tape. Gotcha. So hands can go up now. Oh, surely you've got questions, challenges. Yell at me. It's early. I get to wake up. Mark? Hey, Mark. I saw you back here. <laughs> Um, I remember working on the counties, that uh, Texas counties, there was that spike in the black population of Texas as mm -hmm. the slaves are brought by their, as refugees in, from Louisiana, from the Union Army. Do, has anyone done any work yet about the end of the war and how they get home, do they get home, that whole business? I have a young lady right now who's doing her dissertation on the Texas northwestern frontier during the Civil War, how'd they get involved, what did it mean, what did slavery mean up there. She's the only one I've got working on now who has latched on to those numbers, because she's surprised. You would think Northwestern Frontier, nobody in their right mind would come in there. There's a guy who comes in from Missouri with almost 200 slaves. Now, you've raised a very good question that I've raised with her. That's fascinating. What happens when the war is over? Do these people take their folks and go home? Did they just cut them loose out there? If so, what happened to them? The only person I have is one young lady who's doing it as a chapter in a much larger work on the Northwestern frontier. But that is a great question that I think remains largely unexplored. What happened to this transient black population that came to Texas? And we know that. We can look at the tax rolls and document it. Sometimes three or fourfold increase in the slave populations of East Texas counties. What happened to them after the war? Did they stay here? Did they move west? Did they all become, you know, cowboys like Britt Johnson? And whatever happened to them? Is that that's as much of an answer as I can give you? Yes, sir. <laughs> We're gonna make him run. Uh, uh, Travis. Mm-hmm. Political, not really. Several of the most prominent unionists in these areas, such as Hamilton, um, Hancock, some of the others, were able to stay in the area until fairly late in the war. Hamilton will leave only after a year or two. There was increasing social pressure, though. Um, there were laws for sequestration, which means if you were denounced as an alien enemy and that was proven, they could take your property away. This, again, will be 62, 63 forward. Um, it's an interesting question because one of the points I wanted to work on in my work on Ford is the conscription and the enforcement of the draft in Texas, which Ford was in charge of. And we have anecdotal evidence about camps of unionists in Williamson and Travis County, um, which he would smilingly recount in his memoirs. We were sent out to crush these camps, but somebody, I know not who, fired a shotgun before we got there and warned them so they ran off. I'm thinking Ford probably fired that shotgun. He was very soft-hearted about it. So there were no incidents that I'm aware of in this area, such as Nueces, such as Gainesville. Uh, part of that is Ford. But I'm going to wrap up by also saying we don't know what happened in a lot of these areas because Ford, at the end of the war, being a lawyer, deliberately had himself and William Walsh burn all the conscription bureau records simply because they didn't want anybody filing lawsuits for lost property, lost time, loss of relatives, etc. So I'm only now beginning to piece together little shreds of stuff out of different individuals' compiled service records about the conscription bureau in Texas. Love to do some more about that later. But so far, I'm seeing a pretty quiet pattern in Williamson and Travis, in part because Ford himself was pretty soft-hearted. As I said, somebody fired that shotgun to run them off and give them warning. Uh, Jerry. Absolutely. And you're now running into that problem of only 30 minutes to run my mouth and you hit adobe walls. I'll be, I'll, I'll use a pun. <laughs> but absolutely. Glenn Ely, as you well know, is 
written a very nice book. Um, I enjoyed it, which talks a lot about what was going on in West Texas, where all of our relatives in that area were trading heavily with the Union Army, and people were moving back and forth, and there were spy companies. It's quite a complex story that if anyone is ever brave enough to write a history of Texas in the Civil War, a full-blown book, Alex, we were talking about that over breakfast, that would definitely have to be brought in. Because that's part of the landscape, isn't it? That's part of the story. And leaving out what was happening in El Paso after the Union Army took it over is leaving out a good chunk of the story. You mentioned the incursion into the Indian Territory, and that was 1861. But we know that in 1862, the Cherokees show up at Pea Ridge, and they're fighting on the side of Confederacy. And I was thinking, wait a minute, don't the Cherokees have a bit of an axe to grind against Cherokee the Texas split. government? John Ross's Cherokees will enlist on the Union side. Stan Waddy, of course, as we and that's the way I pronounce his name. I've been told we could pronounce it differently. He'll be the last Confederate general to actually stand down, to surrender. Uh, though I think using the term surrender with Stan Waddy is probably a misnomer. I don't think he ever actually surrendered. I think he just went home. So yes, there were Confederate Choctaw units, Confederate Chickasaw units, uh, Confederate Cherokee. But there were also Union units from all of those. So, yeah, Chili McIntosh, Daniel McIntosh, Douglas Cooper, Albert Pike, these are all Confederate officers who commanded Indian troops for the Confederacy. Absolutely. What I was addressing, though, is how much were they able to control the Indian Territory? I think they were pretty much overwhelmed and almost in a raiding um, mode by 1863 when uh, poor old Sam Bell Maxey is sent up there to do something about it. Yes, sir. Uh, in 1863, after the fall, Colonel was Later that fall, makes his way back to Texas, where his aunt has a heart attack when she sees what miserable shape he's in. Oh. But in 1864, he goes back to Tennessee, and later in 64, is sent to Austin. And I'm wondering, how did he make it back and forth across the Mississippi? <laughs> it's a big river. Now, the fall, that's what, when you start digging in, yes, the fall of Vicksburg, the fall of Port Hudson, the securing of the river under Union control, quotation marks, means you're not going to be moving large divisions of troops, huge wagon trains of supplies, but there's always individuals, small detachments crossing back and forth across that river, carrying mail, carrying dispatches, carrying small amounts of medical supplies, et cetera. So that will continue. I mean, face it, that river is a mile wide by the time you get below New Orleans. And there is no way Union gunboats, as few as they are, are going to keep an individual from crossing that river or an individual leading a small group. So that happens all the time. You see that a lot in the individual service records. They're able to get a letter home by giving it to someone like Moody, who's headed back on recruiting duty, or reassigned, or just going home on leave. And so that happens all the time. There's, a, there's no way to seal the river off. Um, even at the end of the war, you see people crossing. John Bell Hood had every intention of crossing at Natchez. One, one leg and one good arm, and he's picked himself out a good log and a black servant to help him. He's going to cross that river and join the forces in the Trans-Mississippi. Did I mention he was crazy? <laughs> yes. Sidney Albert Johnson, I didn't hear you talk about him, and I understand that Jefferson, uh, should be Davis, thought he was a, a the greatest general from Texas. And had he lived, things would have gone different. But was he really from Texas? Well, he had, yeah. a, he had a ranch in south of Houston, I understand. Yeah, uh, all of them had property here, and that's absolutely correct. Um, I tried to pick one example per theater if you were tracking, so... I picked ones that went all the way from beginning to end and left poor Albert Sidney Johnston under his marker. He's a fine soldier. He probably would have done fantastic things if, as, his, as one writer put it, he had done what a Boy Scout would have done for that wound up behind the knee and at least just put a tourniquet on it. But he didn't, and we lost him early. Yes. Oops, I'm back here. I'm especially grateful. Yes, ma'am? went into the controversy and... Are you asking a rundown on the Great Gainesville hanging? Oh, okay.
Okay. Back to the commercial program of portion of our program. Um, what she's referencing, and I'm going to keep it very simple and very direct, um, the city of Gainesville and the Morton Museum of Gainesville was going to have a very large event. They were going to do cemetery tours. They were going to have a, a ball. Um, they were going to have um, reenactors. They are going to have speakers come up. All of this was for the 150th anniversary of the Great Hanging at Gainesville, Texas. Um, TSHA, Texas State Historical Association, was going to issue a new edition of the Barrett and Diamond accounts combined into one volume now. I wrote the introduction for it. L.D. Clark wrote the epilogue for it. Any of y'all know L.D.? He's a descendant of the fellow who was hanged at Gainesville, and he's still angry about it. So <laughs> you can imagine this epilogue is quite fiery, and he's a good speaker. He's a former English professor for many years at the Gain at, uh, University of Arizona. All of that is to say people in Gainesville decided this was not a good idea. So the city pulled the plug. The Wharton Museum was ordered not to support this, so they're not. So what happened is L.D. Clark's family has stepped in and said, we'll pay the costs. So the Civic Center is still hired for the 13th of October. I will be speaking there. L.D. Clark will be speaking there. Um, Ron Malugin, a local professor, will be speaking. Leon Russell will be there. Not the Leon Russell. <laughs> See, I wanted to give you all that same heart palpitation that I had when I got a message on my phone. And somebody said, Leon Russell wants to talk to you. Oh, man, I finally made it. No, this is a very nice gentleman who actually has staged the first ever memorial services for the victims of the Great Hanging. So we'll have four speakers. The price with the cemetery tours, et cetera, was $125. We no longer have a cemetery tour. We no longer have a military ball. We no longer have several of the speakers. And the price is now zero. You want to come, you are welcome to come. Now, if you want the lunch catered by Romer's Cafe, that's going to cost you a whopping $7, okay? So if you want to eat with us, it's going to cost you 7 bucks. The rest of the show is not going to cost you a thing. We will have the books there. We'll be going out to the cemetery around 2 or 3 o'clock where an SUV color guard will fire a salute over Nathaniel Clark's grave because it will be pretty much the 150th anniversary since the day he was hanged at Gainesville. And then I am told by the Clark family we're all going to adjourn to the Clark family ranch for adult beverages. My favorite part of the program. Well, two, more, two more questions. I think my voice is loud enough, but I will talk into this because I couldn't hear everybody. Uh, when you were speaking about uh, John Baylor going to the Arizona uh, Territory, which we know is California, have you ever heard of any Texans being housed as prisoners of war in that area? Was there a camp for prisoners of war there? I'm going to have to defer to somebody else in the room. I've not heard of such. You're talking about down the Mesilla River Valley. I would assume there had to be POW camps. I'm not sure what arrangements were made for them. Don? You know, I'll, I'll talk about when I go. Okay. He's going to do that. Okay. He's smarter than me. All right. At least in that small area. <laughs> All right, I got one more over here. Do you know of anybody working on, in depth in the quartermaster or supply area that Texas uh, participated in? They should, and there's some wonderful papers, such as George Guess's papers, because um, he was a logistics officer all the way through. Trouble is, when you start talking about logistics to your average Civil War student, undergrad or grad, they fall asleep on you. And I have made them read books that are really essential. I mean, it talks about horse ratios and supplies and all that sort of thing, and I just can't get them through it. So right now, no, and I'm not sure the future is very bright on that front. I, I fully understand how important it is. I can point into some great paper collections of guys who kept, you know, the supplies flowing. But they want the, the guns and the bugles and the flags flying and that sort of thing. Bless their hearts, so did I. You know, can't blame them. I guess we'll wrap it up for Dr. McCaslin. Everybody, please thank Dr. McCaslin.